So I do this for a living, I guess. Um, I uh, do my, not all open source electronics. I have a couple businesses, but we've done many, many boards, and we have a SOP, standard operating procedure, that we use to release things, and we have many contract manufacturers we've worked with through the years, and um, one of the things that is uh, terrible is when there's a new exciting open source project, and then you go to the website, and you see something. I don't know what it is, and we can't figure it out, and what CAD program do they use, and there's a bunch of PDFs, and why are there Word documents there, and so one of the things I want to talk about today is what files we need, and then finally some checklist stuff at the end. So what do you need to be actually open source? Um, went over this earlier this morning, but there is, in fact, a definition, um, and the thing that's really important is the in such a way that anyone can make, modify, distribute, and use those things, and that is really, really, really clear, I think, about what that means. Um, so uh, what does that mean technically? Um, oh, eh, I'll tell you if there's something that falls off the edge. Um, what that means is uh, technically that you could post a PDF of your schematic and you could post, or even a TIFF, something really awful, um, of your Gerber layers. Is there anything worse than a TIFF? I don't think so. Maybe like a J JavaScript script. Um, anyway, um, and then technically, yes, you are open source. You, that's all you have to say. Um, in, in fact, you should have PDFs, right? You should have things that anybody can read without some damn CAD program. Who uses GDA? Oh, you do not. <laughs> Josh, you're such a hipster. For example, GDA. Don't make me use GDA. All right. Um, but the reality is if you just post your PDFs, you're a lazy jerk and we hate you because that's not really open source. That's what I would call read-only open source. That's kind of like the Raspberry Pi, but it's slightly better than Raspberry Pi because they won't give you their damn uh, Gerbers or anything, but they do give you a PDF of their schematic. You're not supposed to copy it. You're not supposed to do anything, but we'll let you have it. Um, so this is good for using and modifying, like hacking, but it prevents making and distributing, which is what is the core of open source, people extending what you've done. Um, so uh, what if we just give them a CAD, give them the source schematic and layout, then we're done, right? Nope, you're not. Um, so the one thing that people don't talk about, and it's our dirty little secret because we're all bad at this, is the license file. Um, if you don't have a license file, it is not open source, period. It is some bizarre, nondescript copyright thing that I can sue your ass over in 13 years or 12 years or whenever the copyright stuff is up. So uh, do not release something without a license, period. Even if the license is, you may not use this. <laughs> That's better than actually no license whatsoever. Um, and uh, you really, really need to include it. Because it's when people say, oh, it's on the web, it's free, it's not. It's really not. It's still subject to copyright, subject to all sorts of things. Um, so I'll pause while you guys go check your repositories for license permission. Um, so which one do you use? I can't help because I'm not a lawyer, right? Um, there's, uh, Oshawa recommends uh, copyleft, hardware specific and permissive ones. Um, I, I really like the CERN open hardware license. It's a little weird, uh, damn Europeans, but I kind of like it. Um, otherwise, I just use the GPL. And, and that's fine. It kind of captures the spirit of what I want it to be. Um, on the other hand, if you just don't care, that's what the MIT and FreeBSD license is for. <laughs> it's like, yours, don't care. Don't blame me when it catches fire. All right. So now, PDF schematic layout, source schematic layout, license, done, right? Yeah, maybe, but you're still a lazy jerk. So the real thing you need next is your build materials. Right? If you want someone to actually use your, use your open source thing or hack your open source thing or really use it, you need to tell them what U1 is. A 7805 on your schematic is not a 7805. It's a 78L05-T6-6, right? And if it's that one, then you know you have to have a low, e, a low e, uh, ESR uh, on your caps or it's going to oscillate, right? So, we know that, but you don't know that, and so you know that's why you have a bill of materials. You're specifying things. Um, and you're going to commit this. And yes, for the software purists, this is a build uh, 
file, right? It's, it's built by your CAD program, but that's okay. We don't care. It's a build product and we're going to commit it anyway because there's more information in the bomb than just the CSV that's generated by your uh, CAD program. Um, uh, when you have completely automated the process and you can type make, then you can get rid of it. <laughs> but then I need to be able to cre recreate it by typing make at my command prompt with all the damn dependencies I have on Python 3 and the do it, no, et cetera. So don't do that. Um, Build materials enables people to make your board. Uh, and specifically, if you have a contract manufacturer that's going to make your board, you need to build materials. They're not going to go into your damn source materials and pull out what R5 is. You need to give it to them, and you need to specify what that is. Um, most importantly, this also includes do not place or no place components. If they don't see a component on their board, they may just assume. They may look at your schematic. They may do other things. So make sure you've got the DMPs in there. Um, and finally, include comments in your build materials. That's like a description and why, not necessarily why you chose the part, but what's important about that part. Yeah. Uh, do not place. Oh, so you might have a bunch of resistors and capacitors that make a filter, but you know you really don't need that. And so you may place them on your circuit board and in the schematic, but not have them stuffed by your contract manufacturer. You may just leave them off because you don't need them. Uh, so that would be a DNP. Ver yeah, I wasn't going to talk about variants today because that's hard and weird, uh, but people will have things that, um, yeah, exactly right. You'll have one version that has the uh, SD card and one version that doesn't, and the version that doesn't will have the DNPs on the SD card, for example. Uh, but there's, there's more weirdness variants because now you've got things that may be DNP or resistance one or resistance two. You, right, you know, it gets complicated. So um, what's in your bill of materials? Well, no one talks about this, which is dumb. Um, so uh, I, at the beginning, I had a link to a... Um, my uh, GitHub repo, um, and you can just download this. I've got three different um, uh, proposed uh, things, build materials. Um, one's minimal, one's preferred, and the one's totes pro. Um, and let me uh, bring them up for just a minute, if you don't mind. Um, sorry, I gotta talk with one, type with one hand. All right. So here's the minimum, right? And this is what we're used to. You guys can't see that. This is what we're used to from almost all open source projects ever, right? It's the number of uh, components. It's the number of refs. It's the manufacturer and the manufacturer part number. Now, one of the things that you're, uh, if you use, e who uses Eagle? Who uses KiCad? Cool, okay. I, I'm not as good at KiCad as I am with Eagle, um, but there's this tendency for them to make a bill of materials that has every single line has one part on it. Don't let it do that. You really want one line per physical component that's going on your board. So you've got a count, you've got the refs that uh, do it, manufacturer, manufacturer part number. This is fine. This will get you, you can go to DigiKey, you can go to Mouse or whatever, you can buy this, right? And you can put that in the CSV file and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a pass, right? <coughs> but what you really want <coughs> is you really want this. Um, and I, uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. You want uh, your count, you want your refs, manufacturer, and now you want a description. What is the GRM155R71C104KA88? I have no idea. Oh, it's 100 nanofarad 0402. Okay, fine, right? So this is not as important sometimes as this. The other thing that's really important that you see there is the 16 volts. So what are the specs of this component? If you say 100 nanofarad capacitor, I'm going to assume I can put a 6.3 volt part, even though it's got a 50 volt buck boost converter, right? And then it actually explodes. Like, let's not do that, right? So um, the, uh, once you get the description, there's this column here called generic. And that's a kind of a weird one. The generic column, I don't, I don't know what a better name for it is, is, is this part generic or not? Is this 100 nanofarad, 16 volt, 0402, and I don't give a rat's ass where you get it or what the manufacturer is or anything? And the answer is yes, this is just a bypass cap. I don't care what it is. As long as it's 16 volts and 100 nanofarads and 0402, you're fine. So it's, I would call this a generic part. Now I've got this inductor down here that's a specialized inductor that is for my switching power supply. That's not generic. You can't just pick 
an inductor that might match this. You could have capacitors that are not, yeah, that have certain voltages. You could have um, inductors with certain uh, self resonant frequencies. This is you telling your user, hey, don't mess with this, you're gonna screw it up. Um, and then finally, there's this idea of custom. A lot of people don't like putting the circuit board in the uh, bill of materials. I'm a strong believer in actually doing that. It is part of the bill of materials. Um, and also, it identifies maybe a version um, and describes what it is and who makes it. Thank you, Ash Park. Okay, and uh, <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, so there you go. Those are the generic vendor and then vendor part number. And that's different, of course, than the manufacturer. Manufacturer part number, do you need this? No. Is it useful? Hell yes, because it's a cross-reference, essentially. And I can now go and literally just put that in the digi key and order it. All right. And then finally, if you're into the totes pro thing, um, if you work with uh, contract manufacturers, you know that they're OCD and unforgiving. And so uh, they like index numbers because you can't want to tell them <laughs> because they do, I don't, I still don't understand. Um, this is something they also like, which is they want a reference for your organization. So if I'm org, then this is component org 001. Now if I have eight boards and they all have 100 nanofarad capacitors that I don't care who, what they are, they're all gonna be org 001s. So they're gonna, if I have eight boards at a contract manufacturer, they may only have, you know, not eight times n parts, but one over eight end parts if they all use the same thing, right? It's, they're all gonna be able to cross-reference to this internal part number. So it's a little weird and a little awkward, but it actually shockingly works. And then uh, rev is a good one because sometimes your circuit board has a rev or sometimes parts have firmware and needs revs and things like that. Um, description again, they like things highlighted in red and yellow when things change, so I put a little key up there. And then also we have alt manufacturer, alt part number, alt distributor, alt uh, distributor part number. So now I can do two or three alternatives that they are free to choose right away without asking me. Because every time your CM talks to you and says, oh my God, they're out of, this, of the uh, Samsung RC0603, blah, blah, blah. You're like, it's just a 0201 2K, just pick one. And so you can give them a couple of them. All right, so that's bill of materials. Probably too much about bill of materials, but there you go. Um, Okay, so PDF schematic, source schematic, uh, and layout, bill materials, you're mostly done. I will love you if this is all you have. I, I you know, give you my, my blessings. What would be really nice is a README file. Um, and uh, what is a README file? Um, well, uh, GitHub will make you one for free, uh, and it's a name and a quick description, uh, who you are and your contact information, what the license is, because the README file is maybe the only form of documentation your user is gonna have. And then, most importantly, what do I need to know to make this project? If, it's just, if it just says, send to Osh Park to layer, that's fine. That's all you need to say. Um, but uh, quite often, there's an, uh, a lot that you need more, right? Who does RF, scary RF stuff? A couple of you, and yeah, you all look damaged, like damaged people, so that's right. Um, and that's because um, the, uh, th that stuff matters, right? It, like, all of a sudden, you need to know what your board is made out of, what the thicknesses are, et cetera. So PCB fabrication information is the first one. How many layers? What's the thickness? Um, if you are doing radio frequency stuff, you need to specify the stack up. How thick are, is your uh, internal core? 1.6 millimeters like an Osh Park, is that okay? Um, uh, you specify it. Uh, the array information. If you're going into production, you're not just gonna send them one board. Your contract manufacturer will have a cow, unless your board is like, you know, 20 by 20 centimeters or something, and that's all they can fit. And so they're gonna put that, your board into an array. Tell them how to do it. Don't let them just do it. Um, we love Osh Park, but Osh Park will just put your board in an array and there's nothing you can do about it. That's fine. We still have scars on our fingers from taking off the, the little you know, mouse bites where exactly you don't want them to be, right? So this is something where you specify that. Um, and then of course file names with descriptions because I don't know what three letter file name extensions mean Gerber top layer to you. GTL is a kind of car. All right, uh, assembly information. Um, what's weird about assembling your board? Is it all surface mount? Is it a mix? Um, what parts can stand reflow and what have to be hand soldered? Uh, is it Rojas, meaning is it lead free or not? Um, uh, how should it be inspected after it's soldered? Um, and then file names with descriptions on that as well. So it's just a 
going through one by step by step by step, just making sure people understand what's going on. So now we have the README, and finally, to be kick-ass open source hardware, you need to give me your build files too. And that's because I don't want to run GDA, sorry Josh, um, and I don't want to run Eagle or whatever. I want the Gerber files, please give them to me. And in not just the Gerber files, but also the mounting files, the XY coordinates. If I have an open source pick and place machine, I don't want to do it by hand, and I don't want to have to go and run your damn EDA tool in order for me to get the, pick, the XY coordinates. Um, there's this thing called ODB++, which is the industry likes and everyone else hates, um, and it's this non it's a closed standard that describes your board. It's very good for test, very, very good for test. Avoid it like the plague. Uh, IPC 356 is another board file that you would use specifically for test and making sure that the people who do the, des the DFM, the design for manufacturing reviews at the board house and your assembly house can both double check what you're doing. Really, like, the IPC 356, you might have never heard of it, the most cost-effective saving, however you want to say that, file I've ever used in my entire life. They have caught more eagle bugs in the IPC 356 file than anything else. So uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, does, does anybody know, does KiCad do 356? Okay. Um, and then finally, there's one last thing I'm going to ask, and that is a data sheet. So, You've been working with this thing so damn closely, you don't even remember what it doesn't do, right? Or like why you did it, or how you plug it in. Um, and um, I don't know that. Yeah, it's got a USB plug on it, but is that for power? And if I plug the external coax jack and the USB in at the same time, will that like, you know, overcurrent my USB jack? I don't know. Now I'm going to go waste like you know 20 minutes of my time going through your damn schematic, finding out whether there's a diode between the external power and the USB. Don't make me do that. Put that in the data sheet. How do I hook it up? What do I have to be careful of? Um, what are its specs? Uh, what's the voltage inputs, the voltage outputs? How does it actually work? I mean, don't forget, we know all this stuff because we've been doing this forever. They may not know. Let's actually describe how it works. Um, use cases are really super powerful. Um, are there any uh, undergraduate students in the room? Excellent. So uh, undergraduates, think that you're describing this for a senior electrical engineering student, which means the absolute least qualified person to understand what you're trying to do. Um, they may understand what resistors and capacitors and inductors and ICs are, but they don't know what you're trying to do. So that is what the data sheet is for. Use cases are really important for that. And then also, why is it different? What's your cool about yours? Th that data sheet, which you could call requirements, you could call requirement specifications, you could qu call whatever you want, is an integral part to making people happy. If you have this, you have no idea how much people will love you. Um, why is it different than other projects is what's cut off. Okay, so there you go. That's, that's the files I think you should have in your open source projects on GitHub. Or that you should have. Okay, so, um, uh-oh. Oh, damn. Sorry. Okay. Process. Um, <laughs> I should have started with, I guess. Um, this is the formal way of doing things. You guys have all done SOPs, I'm sure, in your life. They're all awful. We all hate them. Um, and when you're uh, in development, you don't use SOPs. That's dumb. You're too busy. However, when you're going to do a release, and your release is going to affect literally thousands of people, don't get it wrong. Use some kind of checklist. Um, it will save you time and money and pain and suffering and shame, I know from personal experience. Um, and uh, one of like, the worst things that everybody does is they do one last tweak. They kind of put it, they send it to their CMs, and they forget to push, right? And so now the whole world thinks you're on version 1.1, but you've actually uh, just sent 1.2 to production. And only like eight months after it's in the, the field and everybody hates you, somebody tells you it's version 1.1 on your website. Okay, so checklist of checklists. Um, these are the three that I, I suggest. A schematic checklist, a layout checklist, and a release checklist. Um, and uh, let me go over those, but um, the last thing I want is automate. Um, those software weenies have been automating build processes for like two decades, and we should be there too. Um, and so the fact that, you know, we have make, which is awful, and you can blame the software people for that, um, but it exists. 
um, and your CAD file, especially KeyCAD, is scriptable. Let's use that. Let's make a make file that reproducibly builds build materials, reproducibly builds Gerbers and Exelons. Um, and then also, maybe there's a tree that divides these things up. So everybody, everything you need for the fabrication files for your board house goes in one folder. All your documentation goes in another. You can print to PDF using the make file. Like, like let's, let's do this, right? Let's be able to type make and then make push and then be done. All right. Um, and the last thing says, some pain now will forever make release easy and reliable. All right. So uh, what our checklist, and then I will let you go. Okay, you can't read this either. Um, this is a schematic checklist. Yeah, you can kind of read that. It is a thousand things. They're all dumb. But one of these dumb things will save your ass. Um, and I don't know which one it is. For me, it's always like, you know, don't forget to run the ERC, the electrical rule check, before you push, right? Um, uh, but things like parts values, special case capacitors marked with power and tolerance. Who forgets to do that? I do, all the stinking time. Um, special case resistors marked with power and tolerance. Check out your uh, specialized parts are at stock at the distributor. Um, that's really important. I cannot tell you how many failures I've seen. I I've worked with... Thousands now? No, not thousands. High hundreds of boards made by students at Portland State. And what happens is they make the schematic, they make this board, they send it to production, they've got three weeks left in the term, and they order their parts, and they're all out of stock, or they're end of life, they're gone. And there's no time to do another Osh Park run. They're screwed. And so what I tell them to do is, if you've not ordered your parts before your board arrive, or before you push off your board, you're not going to graduate well. I'd say that, but they will. But, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not going to, that's right. It's not, it's not going to, you know, it's not good. So um, that kind of thing. So there are that kind of checklist. Electrical rule checks. All of your components have values, including NP for no place. MOSFETs are oriented correctly. Don't get your MOSFETs backwards. Uh, design and then best practices, right? There's also um, a PCB checklist, which I'm sorry, it's kind of eagle-centric. Uh, but it's like, you know, making sure your ground planes are actually ground, setting your grid to something reasonable, running the DRC, um, printing out your PCB one-to-one -one on a color printer, and putting your components on it. Who's ever screwed up an IC package before? MSSOP versus SLP versus MSOP? You just don't know what you're ordering because TI makes it BVRD versus BVD versus whatever. You order the wrong part and you're screwed unless you've printed it out and actually place it on the actual color printout. So great, do that. Also, you'll find out all the stupid errors that you've made about putting components too close together. Um, and then finally, um, there's the final release checklist. And this is dumb, but will get you every time. Go through the other checklists, commit your stuff, make the build, check your version numbers, make sure they're all aligned, order your bomb first, and then do the release. So um, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, sorry, I ran out of time and stuff. Um, and uh, I'll take questions, or you have, we have 20 seconds for questions. <laughs> <coughs> Yes, wouldn't that be great? I would love that, especially hardware standards. We have lots and lots and lots of um, commercial companies really happy to make standards that are good for them and bad for everybody else. So it'd be really nice to have an open source standards organization, which I thought Oshawa was going to do, but hasn't yet. But one day we'll force them to do it. Thanks, guys.